Good morning and welcome to the Pines and Maloney classes and others joining us on this Sunday morning, March the 7th. This is the third Sunday in Lent as the church journeys through what we call a prophetic Lent. Note that this quarter's lessons introduce the ministry of the Old Testament prophets. In a similar vein, the centerpiece of our worship services each Sunday morning during Lent is the Old Testament text of the Revised Common Lectionary. As it says in our bulletin, lifting up the voices of those ancient prophets as we seek God's word for today. Thus you will hear a lot about prophets for the remainder of Lent and on through the end of May. My prayer for us today continues to be that everyone is well as we await the possibility of everyone being vaccinated against the coronavirus. I encourage you to discuss your joys and concerns with family and friends and to use the worship, education, mission, fellowship, and ministerial resources that are available from the church. Our pastors, staff, and committees are working hard to make sure that our faith is being nurtured and our ministries are kept alive in this time of pandemic. My joy to share today with you is that Jane and I have both now had our two COVID vaccinations and that our families are doing well. I pray for the health and well being of our church staff as they have returned to the church building this past week and for the safety of our preschool teachers, children, and families who returned to the building this past week for in person school. Please pray for them. As mentioned earlier, our lessons this quarter introduced the ministry of the Old Testament prophets. God employs people who live among Israel and Judah to be spokespersons for God. As a representative of God, the prophet has a message meant to affect social change that conforms to God's desired standards as prescribed under the law. In this quarter's first unit, called Faithful Prophets, we will hear of prophets who were necessary in Israel's history to speak God's word to them and illustrate the fulfillment of God's promise. In the second unit, Prophets of Restoration, we will see prophets who presented hope to the Israelites during the times in Israel's history when the people continuously forsook the ways of God. In the third unit, Courageous Prophets of Change, we will follow prophets who were sent to call the people to restore their covenant relationship with God after they were released from captivity and charged to rebuild Jerusalem. Thus, in this quarter, we will follow the long sweep of the history of Israel by following prophets faithful to God's covenant. As we begin the quarter, we should look briefly at the current ideas of who prophets are. As you might expect, they include more than just our definition as a revealer of God's word in the Old and New Testament. If you look in the dictionary and find a definition of prophet, in addition to the biblical meaning of prophet, usually focused on the Old Testament, you find prophets from other religions, such as Mohammed. You also find other definitions. Here's one, one gifted with more than ordinary spiritual and moral insight. Another, one who foretells or predicts future events. Another, an effective or leading spokesman for a person, for cause, doctrine, group, or movement. And finally, another one you find is a person regarded as or claiming to be an inspired teacher or leader. We could have an interesting in-person discussion right now if I just said a prophet is dot, 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 and you could fill in your feeling about who a prophet is or what a prophet is. We can't do this right now, but I want you to think about this as we go through this quarter and look at all the Old Testament prophets that are in our lesson book. For now, as you look at these current definitions, you see examples given in the dictionary of 
who some of these people are, such as an inspired poet, a weather prophet, prophets of doom, a spiritual seer. And this very broad expanded definition, especially in our current era, we may have trouble in discerning true prophets. This in fact will be part of our lesson today. What is a true prophet? Our lesson today comes from eight verses buried roughly in the middle of Deuteronomy. It is from Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22. And our lesson is titled Moses, Prophet of Deliverance. So Moses is our focus today except not in the case that you, not in the way that you really might expect. This will be the only part of Deuteronomy we will look at this quarter. So I felt that we needed to take a broader look at this Old Testament book for some context before we begin. The Hebrew title of this book is taken as its custom from its opening words in Deuteronomy 1.1. These are the words. I will not butcher the Hebrew title, but that's what the translation is. These are the words. The first verse is incomplete. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness on the plain opposite. And then a long list of old places that are east of the Jordan where the Israelites were now camped at the end of the book of Numbers. The Greek title of the book, the one that we use, is from the Greek translation of the Hebrew called the Septuagint, and that's obviously Deuteronomy, which means the second law, or according to the commentators, probably a better translation of the Hebrew is a copy of the second of the law, second law or a copy of the law. The title of the book could be taken from Deuteronomy 17, 18, which is a general discussion of what a king is like in Israel. And it says this, when he has taken the throne of his kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law written for him in the presence of the Levitical priest. The original law is obviously the one given by God to Moses at Sinai. This copy in Deuteronomy is an important example of the way that law and teaching develop theologically to meet requirements of new times while preserving continuity with the old. Here, the legal tradition of Exodus is not just repeated verbatim, it is reinterpreted in contemporary terms so that the promises and demands of the covenant were brought near to every worshiping Israelite. So some context about where we are in history. At the end of the book of Numbers, Israel is encamped in the plains of Moab, prepared for an attack upon Canaan from the east. Deuteronomy purports to be Moses' farewell address to the people in which he rehearses the mighty acts of the Lord solemnly warns of temptations and the new ways of Canaan and pleads for loyalty to and love of God as the condition for life and the promised land. In the words of the commentator Patrick D. Miller, he says, this book would have been important and significant to Israel in its history. It is written as coming from the beginnings of a people that point when they were forming a nation. It was meant to found a people and to guide their ongoing life. Whatever may have been the now disguised processes of how this was transmitted before it was written down, Deuteronomy is to be received as foundational, mosaic, original, for all the people, and authoritative. The ostensible setting of the book, therefore, is to be taken with utmost seriousness. Now, Deuteronomy is not just one long address by Moses, as the first verse says. It actually contains three addresses from Moses to the people of Israel as they await the ability to go into Canaan, which Moses will not be able to do with them, remember. The first address is found roughly in the first four chapters. This is roughly an historical review of events since the departure from Sinai in 
to show how the Lord marvelously guided the people of Israel in the wilderness. This address ends with an appeal and exhortation, again, as always, for faithful obedience. The second address begins at chapter four and continues until the end of chapter 28. It is the heart of the book and is a speech where Moses instructs the people on the way they are to live. Our lesson is from this very long discourse. The third address is contained in chapters 29 and 30, where Moses again, as always, again and again, exhorts Israel to renew the covenant and warms of the disastrous consequences of disobedience. The remainder of Deuteronomy, chapters 31 to 34, tells of the concluding events of Moses' life and his death. For our purposes, I want to read to you the last three verses of Deuteronomy, from Deuteronomy 34. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequal for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent to him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. And for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. We can also note that allusions to and citations from Deuteronomy in the New Testament are to be found more frequently than is the case from Deuteronomy than for any other New Testament book. Jesus used it frequently. As the writer of your lesson book writes elsewhere, <clears throat> excuse me, most scholars have identified the core of Deuteronomy with the book of the law found in the temple in the time of King Josiah, who reigned right at the end of the seventh century BC from 641 to 609. The book as a whole, he says, was likely composed in the context of religious reforms advanced by King of Josiah, perhaps not by Moses, obviously, perhaps by a Levite who was attempting to turn his contemporaries away from polytheism. But placing the sermons of Deuteronomy in the mouth of Moses is not completely fiction because it represents a revival of the Mosaic teaching as it was understood in the seventh century BCE. For timeline's sake, you should remember that Exodus, according to the commentators, was either in the 13th century BC or the 15th century BC. There still seems to be some disagreement about that, but well before the book was actually written down in the time of King Josiah. Our lesson comes from this central core of the book. As we read our scripture from today's lesson, note that our lesson is not about the signs and wonders, are the mighty deeds, are the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed. It is a more general address and causes us to think broadly about prophets, how prophets speak in the name of the Lord, how they discern, how to discern real prophecy so that when Israel hears prophecy in the future, they will heed the prophet. So here is our lesson, Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb, Sinai, on the day of the assembly when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore or ever again see this great fire, I will die. <clears throat> then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, 
I myself will hold accountable. God will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. You may say to yourself, how can we recognize a word that the Lord has not spoken? If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, it is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be frightened by it. So the central core of Deuteronomy begins with the Ten Commandments and the Shema for its theological orientation. And the rest of this is basically a review of the commandments of God and a discourse on what is now known as the Deuteronomic Law Code, which is further rules and regulations for life, but based on the Ten Commandments and the Great Commandment. Our lesson comes from a long section in this central core dealing with leaders and institutions. The part of this section that contains our lesson starts with the rights of the priest, who are in fact leaders of the people, and then has two sections on what are called the true prophet. In the verses just before our lesson, we hear Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14, which contains prohibitions about what the people are not to do. This is instructive because it leads directly into the first verse of your lesson. So here is what Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14 says. When you come into the land that the Lord is giving you, Canaan, you must not learn to imitate the abhorrent practices of those nations. No one shall be found among you who makes a son or daughter pass through fire, or who practices divination, or is a soothsayer, or an augur, or a sorcerer, or one who casts spells, or who consults ghosts or spirits, or who seeks oracles from the dead. For whoever does these things is abhorrent to the Lord. It is because of such abhorrent practices that the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You must remain completely loyal to the Lord your God. Although these nations that you are about to dispossess do give heed to the soothsayers and diviners, as for you, the Lord your God does not permit you to do so. So this sets the stage for the verses in your lesson. Our lesson uses basically these prohibitions and sets the prophet in our lesson over against them. The list is long enough to indicate clearly that all customary ways of discerning the divine will are planned by magic or divination are rejected. Let's read that again. All customary ways of discerning the divine will are planned by magic or divination are rejected. That naturally raises the implicit question then of how the people can divine or discern what God is going to do. Our lesson clearly, immediately sets forth the answer. The Lord will raise up a prophet. Some commentators use the word prophets here, it's plural. This prophet will reveal the divine will. Note that here there is an emphasis on the divine initiative, not the human initiative, but the divine initiative. That's one of the things we need to remember when we continue in our lesson and talk about false prophets. <clears throat> this prophet will reveal the divine will based on God's initiative. This is something God will do over against all the human devices mentioned in the previous verses. God will raise up the prophet and God will put God's words in the prophet's mouth. 
<clears throat> and the prophet will speak to Israel all that God commands. This is the true prophet. The prophet is a central part of the new order that is set forth here in Deuteronomy. The leader through whom the divine will is made known. Note the last verse in the verse 19. Anyone who doesn't heed the prophet is held accountable <clears throat> by God. As the commentator Beth Tanner says, this passage begins with the reason why prophets are needed. It reaches back to the giving of the law in Exodus 19 and 20. When the people heard God speak, they were so frightened, <clears throat> excuse me, they begged Moses to speak with God and be their mediator. Prophets then are selected by God for the sake of the people. Prophets answer to God, not to the people. So prophets are free to speak the truth. Prophets also come from among their own people. These speakers of truth are homegrown. They know the ways and the hearts of the people they speak to and connect with them. They who speak for God must also be paid attention to, for to ignore their calls is the same as ignoring God. She continues to fully grasp the meaning of this passage in a modern context. Some explanation is necessary. What is the modern equivalent of ancient prophets, she asked. First, most people are unfamiliar with exactly what a prophet was in the ancient Near Eastern context. In biblical times, prophets were not rare. Indeed, 2 Kings tells that the king of Israel had 400 prophets at his disposal. The problem was not finding a prophet. It was finding a prophet that was truly speaking for God. Prophets performed a wide range of functions including some that are condemned in the passage we just read. Ancient prophets, however, were distinct from priests, she makes this distinction, who were responsible for leading the people in worship. The only function of an ancient prophet was to declare the word of God to the people. They did not run meetings or organize the congregation. There is another obvious feature of these verses that contrast with the Canaanites who the Israelites are getting ready to overcome. Know how every verse in the last five verses of our lesson puts an emphasis on the, the word, word. Revelation of the divine will for the future as well as the present is through the word of the Lord. Word, then, is the overarching category in Deuteronomy for speaking about the Lord's instruction for life and God's intention for the future. <clears throat> the last three verses of our lesson deal with the big question that still remains. After we've been told who a true prophet is and how God sends the true prophet, we still need to know if there is to be one whom God speaks the word that is to be obeyed after Moses. If there is to be one to whom God speaks the word that it to, is to be obeyed after Moses, who has already been, we're told, the preeminent prophet, after Moses die, dies, how will the people know who that one is? Especially if there are various persons as indeed there were in that community and in ours probably, claiming to speak that way. As Patrick Miller says again, the problem of false prophecy was a real one. Who speaks the word of the Lord? And how does one discern the true prophet and the true word when there are conflicting words and claims? The issue arises a number of times in the Bible. 1 Kings 22 is an account of kings inquiring of the Lord through prophets before battle to see whether or not God will give victory. The kings of Israel and Judah question 
whether the prophets are giving them a true word. Notice the word true again, that will come back later. And so send for another prophet. Micaiah, he gives them an unpleasant counter word of defeat, not victory, and declares that the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of the other prophets. Very strong words. So who's the true prophet in that scenario? <clears throat> Jeremiah contended with false prophets frequently. For example, the conflict between Jeremiah and other prophets, particularly Hananiah, Hananiah announced peace and God's victory over Babylon. Jeremiah declared that the Lord would put upon the neck of Judah and other nations an iron yoke of servitude to the king of Babylon. So Deuteronomy 18.20, the beginning of this last three verses in this section, identifies two kinds of false prophets. Notice what they are. The one who speaks falsely in the name of the Lord and the one who speaks in the name of other gods. The latter danger, speaking of other, in, in the name of other gods, reflects Deuteronomy's continual concern for resistance to the intrusion of other gods seeking Israel's ultimate allegiance, particularly as they enter a land that has all sorts of other gods. But it is clear from verse 21 and the stories mentioned above that the critical issue the people faced was the fact of differing prophetic words, all claiming to come from the Lord. Verse 21 reflects the problem and verse 22 addresses the problem. The criterion is a rather simple one, he says. The authentic the word of the Lord is a word that comes to pass, comes to reality. This criterion is part of the view of history reflected in Deuteronomy and the Bible generally, that history is in God's control, both announced and affected by God's word. The authentic divine word is the one that is worked out in history. The books of Kings reflect this understanding and that one of the main threads binding that history into a whole is the movement from prophecy to fulfillment. The criterion of true prophecy is what it should be, truth. The correspondence between the prophetic word and the realities of history, both Old Testament and New Testament demonstrate that correspondence again and again for the prophetic words they contain. Indeed, it is those words proven true by this criterion that have become a part of the canon of scripture. He continues though, <clears throat> one must acknowledge, however, that the ability to decide is somewhat retrospective from this point of view. Thus, other criteria come into play in the biblical reports. And this is a list of a couple of ways that we know whether it's true, even if it didn't come to pass. For example, the authenticating calls of the prophets that testify to their prophetic role as operating out of the Lord's compulsion and often against their own desires or the consistency of the word of a prophet with that of prior prophets. So those are some help. Hopefully us will continue with that thought in a second. The problem for us today though, is that we often need to make a decision in the moment and can't wait to see what becomes of the prophet's word. The question is who speaks for God? So let me give you some advice given to us by another commentator. Catherine M. Schifferdecker, who says it this way, there are lots of people who claim to speak for God today. Prosperity preachers, self-help gurus, radio and TV preachers, religious bloggers galore, and she even lumps in church pastors who get up Sunday after Sunday 
to proclaim God's word. There are a bunch of people who want to be considered, considered by you as prophets. She suggests if we take the larger witness of the Old Testament prophets seriously, which is what this whole quarter is about, there are some other things we can say. So here they are. One, the true prophet does not seek to be a prophet. Remember Moses gave a long protest against God's call and Jeremiah objected that he was only a boy. Second, the true prophet seeks neither self-promotion nor riches. Thirdly, the true prophet speaks God's word, God's word, not his or her own. Over and over again, the prophets declare, thus says the Lord. And they must often speak words that are uncomfortable, to say the least. Words of judgment for their own people. True, she says, they also speak words of comfort and hope, but almost always on the other side of judgment. Their hope rests on God alone, not on their own power or worth. Fourthly, the true prophet bears a family resemblance, she has that in quotes, to what has come before. The prophets speak new words into new situations, she says. The Holy Spirit moves in new and unexpected ways. Nevertheless, she says, if the prophet's words contradict what we already know of God from scripture, then they and the prophet should be suspect. The true prophet and the false prophet is known by his or her fruit. Jesus warns, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by your fruits, by their fruits. Does the prophet or preacher lead others to be disciples of Jesus or of themselves? Does his or her preaching lead to repentance and transformation or to complacency and self-absorption in her fifth, re fifth thing we should consider? So I end our lesson with another quote from her. Who speaks for God, she says. The answer requires discernment and prayer. Scripture gives us some guidelines, and there are probably more than what I have listed here. And all that we do, of course, as we hear and study God's word, and as we are given the great privilege and the responsibility to proclaim it ourselves, to proclaim it ourselves, we must do so with a healthy dose of humility, pointing always to Jesus, our great prophet, priest, and king. So there is hopefully some helps for how to discern true prophecy. I want to end with a question for further thought. How do we know if someone is truly speaking for God, or if they are using God to try to serve their own social political or personal interest. I hope we have seen some of those ways today. So let's end with a prayer. Faithful God, help us to discern when someone is truly speaking for God. Help us individually as we speak the word of God to others. May we be reminded to love strongly with all our heart and soul. Help us to be well and safe amid the pandemic and to be patient as we await vaccination. Help us to seek help when we need it and to be in contact with friends and family. Help us to continue your mission in the world by helping those who are less fortunate and are currently suffering from physical, emotional, and social pain. In your son's name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining me today. Be safe and stay healthy.